Hi, I'm Amber. And I'm Jessie. And this is Glowing in Tech. Sponsored by Makers. So today we have the wonderful Stephanie Itami joining us. Thanks so much for coming, Steph. Um, would you like to give us a little bit about you and who you are and what you do? For sure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and a bit about myself. So my name is Stephanie Timmy. I'm founder of Sidia. Um, That's kind of like my main career. So with Sidia as a social enterprise and we're focused on helping black and minority ethnic women build cybersecurity careers. Prior to that, I worked in government in cyber intelligence roles. Um, and then before that, I did some work with BBC looking at um, disinformation within the WhatsApp app during the Ebola pandemic. Um, and now I'm doing my PhD in cybersecurity, hopefully taking all that knowledge. Um, and my research right now is kind of focused on domestic workers. So I'm looking at their security, but physical security, looking at gated communities within Lagos State in Nigeria. And hopefully, I hope to highlight the issues around kind of the, in my opinion, unfair data collection, especially mm-hmm. with the biometrics. And now in Nigeria, they're moving more into smart cities mm-hmm. and smart homes. And a lot of the homes have like fingerprints to get yeah. in and cameras. And it's thinking, where's all that information going? Um, so it's really looking at that and hopefully bringing out other aspects or so- sociological aspects um, to it. And hopefully the idea is I'm able to bring some light on domestic workers and the important work that they do, but also the harsh reality of their surveillance that is also surrounded with their work, especially as we move on to this smart city agenda that Lagos State is um, trying to put. So that's kind of like my research and my background. Amazing, that's a lot. And I'm so excited to talk to you about all of that. Um, Would you be able to give us an industry insight in five and let us know a little bit more about what cybersecurity is And if I'm somebody interested in the field, your tips to getting into it. For sure. So I always say that cybersecurity is split into two parts. So you have your technical and non-technical. Interesting or like to me an easy way of understanding the non-technical is you're trying to protect critical data. So that data could be anything. And with that, you're looking at administrative. So for example, before you go to work, they already create an email for you. Why can't you create your own email? These are kind of questions that you have to ask. It's because it has to be separate to ensure the integrity of the data. Mm. Um, And with kind of information security, it also has to do with physical security as well. So for example, if I have an important laptop, in this place for example i'm going to make sure the doors are locked and things like that so that's when you have like physical security and then there's technical security and that's going more into cyber Mm -hmm. so cyber security and information security are two different things um cyber security is under information security and that's all about how do we protect the critical systems that protect the critical data? Mm. So that's looking at laptops, phones, IOTs. Um, and cybersecurity is a fascinating field. I think the best way to view it is there's about nine domains and it's understanding how the domains work, the different business functions that exist within cybersecurity. So if you're looking at physical, that's going to be, you know, people don't think they are part of cyber it's like oh this is just a different entity but it's heavily linked because before you get to your workplace there's like a barrier and then you have a staff card who produces those staff cards you know um and with the barriers as well it's ensuring that the authorized people can get into the building and then like with business continuity which is like a different aspect is if there's an attack yes there's an incident response team which kind of takes um stock of what took place, what was a cyber attack, what can they learn from it and how can they improve it? But also you have your business continuity, which is ensuring that the business still functions even though there's an attack. So it's very complex and it's a large field. And I think a lot of people tend to think that it's just um, hackers or ethical hacking, but it's yeah, not. Yeah. Um, it's super interesting because even when you go to security awareness or you're, you know, you're trying to kind of stop internal risk or external risk. Um, so I think cybersecurity is all about protecting information or protecting systems that hold that information. But the ways in which that takes place is very different based on the industry based on the size of the company Mm -hmm. and also based on what data the company actually holds. Mm -hmm. So I hope that wasn't too... um, (laughs) I think that was the interest. Yeah, I think that was good. That's fantastic. And I think you've given a really good overview 
that means that people can understand how vast it is. Because like yeah. you said, I think there's like a perception of it being a very specific thing. But as you've just explained, there's so many different parts to it. So what would you advise if I'm somebody that knows nothing about any of them? How do I figure out what it is I want to do or how would I get into it? For sure. So I would always say research different domains. Mm -hmm. um, because once you have an idea of the different domains and how the industry works, you can say, okay, my skills are best suited for this. So people always say like, oh, how can I get into cybersecurity? First of all, every job deals with risk. Yes. Whatever job you're doing, you're always assessing what's the cost benefit of a decision. How do I make the right decision? So you already have those skills. So it's thinking, okay, how do I translate those skills? Is it me going into governance? Is it me going to risk management? Is it me going into auditing or assurance, which deals with risk, deals with um, companies actually complying to legislations, security policy. So that's kind of the easiest way for people who have a non-technical background. Yeah. Now, I always say that always good to do a certification because cybersecurity is one of the, I wouldn't say few fields, but it's one of the fields that certification actually holds the same weight as degree, in my opinion. Okay. So having a the right certification really goes a long way because people want to know that you you understand the logic, you understand the scope, you understand the acronyms because there's lots of acronyms within cybersecurity, unfortunately. So the entry level certifications, if you're a complete beginner, you don't want to kind of start from medium level, complete. I know CompTIA does a ITF, which is like for service desk, if like that's kind of like the beginner roles that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you, you feel like you have enough knowledge, you've done, you've seen the different domains and you kind of want to start with normal entry level, then you even want to do the BCS CISMP or you want to do the CompTIA Security Plus. And why you want to do these two certifications is because they give you a full overview like i said cybersecurity is very broad mm -hmm. and even with me trying to kind of differentiate business continuity this is governance this is a different um secure software development mm -hmm. a different element but once you're able to do this two certifications first it actually lets you understand okay which part did i enjoy studying the most yeah which yeah. parts um spoke to me or i feel like i can kind of um build a career in so for me when i did my um cismp i realized i hated network security and i'm not going <laughs> near network security but i love physical security and i love um, the idea of you know buildings and people and how they move in space and stuff so i'm more interested in that aspect um and how it then links to psychology behavior mm -hmm. um and risk but somebody else might do it and realize actually no i really like the management side of it i like the um i like the part of me speaking to people maybe i don't want to be at a computer desk all day i want to converse with people so maybe you might be interested in the training side and security awareness and having conversations or the policy side somebody might say you know listen i don't want to deal with anybody i just want to <laughs> come do my job and go and stay on the computer then you might like to secure um, software development or you might like, you know, being a SOC analyst or incident response where you're actually looking at the computer. And you, you know, you're working with different um, incident response software and dashboards and you're translating. What does this mean? You're analyzing it. You're creating solutions. You're creating preventive security controls. So it's very vast. And by doing those two certifications, you don't have to do both of them. You can do one or the other. But by doing those certifications, it does give you an overview of the ecosystem mm. and lets you begin to position, okay, this is where I think I fit. This is what I'm interested in. And then once you know your domain, then you can build on it. You yeah. can then work on skills yeah. and then work experience. And I always say that, you know, especially for, if you're from a minority group, you have the luxury of social networks, whether it's your church or the mosque or, you know, religious organization or even just your friends. Everybody mm -hmm. has some sort of side hustle or business. Are you approaching your friend to say, you know, listen, let me help you with your business. Let me give you some security advice. Mm -hmm. And why that's important is because it does allow you to gain those experience and to put what you're learning into practice before you even start applying for jobs. Yeah. So it's creating your own opportunities and it's also giving you that assurance because this is one of the fields where there are there is a high, huge demand, but there are very limited people who can do it. So it's a great area to grow. And because it's so vast, just because you're starting in governance doesn't mean you can't end up doing a technical role in the future. Mm -hmm. So because of that, there's a huge scope to grow. So it's understanding, you know, having that assurance 
allows you when you're going for job interviews, when you're speaking to employers, it shows them that, okay, this person knows what they're talking about. Yeah. This person has the enthusiasm. I'm going to hire that person. Yeah. So it's not as difficult as people think it is. It's just being able to understand the ecosystem. And unfortunately, I feel like cybersecurity has a bad rap. It's seen as a boys club, which is no surprise. You know, according to statistics, 20% of the sector is women. Worldwide, 80% is men. So because of that, a lot of people, especially women, do sometimes feel deterred from going towards cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. But it's an open industry for anyone. You just need to understand the ecosystem and the acronyms. Yeah, yeah, that's really great advice. And I love that you mentioned the certifications as well. It's like a good place to start too. And we'll make sure to include all the links and the resources that you've mentioned in the show notes for the episode as well. Yeah, and like for technical roles in cybersecurity, is there a standardized kind of interview process for that? And what technologies would you normally see for those pursuing that kind of career path? So there are two types. First, you need to understand Linux. Mm -hmm. um, that's if you're going more on like the ethical hacking aspect of it. Um, if you want to do more incident response, it's understanding, doing a lot of labs um, practice. And you can do that with the CompTIA. I think they have it. Other certifications also have labs as well. So eCouncil, they do labs with their um, certified ethical hacker. So if you're understanding ways to configure the systems, if you're practicing, and also there's loads of CTF, so capture the flag exercises as well, where you can show those skills. But it's understanding the different technology being used. So incidents response constantly does event monitoring. It scans the system, whether it's the network of the laptop, the network itself, maybe it was wireless network, remote network, um, mobile, it scans it continuously to produce reports on these are the current threat levels. Well, that's if you're working for an advanced organization. If it's a small business, it's going to be a different topic. Mm. But if you're working for like a medium size or a large organization, you'd be working with these softwares where you are trying to, on a daily basis, um, First, well, actually, first of all, there's different roles between the security operations center, which is the main technical part mm -hmm. of um, cybersecurity. So if you're wanting to go into a technical side, you will probably be working as a SOC analyst. So with the security operations center, they have different roles within there and people have different functions. So you have people identifying the risk and that could be working with the incident response technology where you're identifying and you're monitoring what are the current threat levels, are there any attacks? And if there are attacks, solving it and then producing reports. Then you have the other side, which is an analysis. So you're looking at, okay, these are the events that have taken place. These are the attacks that have taken place. What can we learn from that? And then how can we then improve our preventive security measures or if we if we don't understand what's going on, do we need to increase capabilities for that? And then that's when you kind of have the more business side of it, where you have to use different frameworks. So I know one of the most common one is the open fair risk assessment, where you're actually um, communicating the risk, solutions, threats in money. So you're saying that um, if we get X Y Z solution or software, we'll be able to save eighty thousand pounds. Mm. Um, however, due to this risk, it's going to cost us 180 if we don't do anything about it within six months. Mm. And that's kind of how you're going to get the business side to increase the capabilities. So you then have the people who are analyzing it. And then the analysis goes back into, OK, how do we respond if this attack comes back again? How do we improve our preventive measures? Um, and then during the recovery stage, that's when you're working with the business continuity operation resilience team, which is. During an attack, what do we do? How do we make sure that we function? How do we store our data? If there's a data leak, do we have different places where we are storing our information? And then you have um, other people who are kind of dealing with, within that business continuity and disaster management, they're dealing with the insurance side of it. So if an attack takes place and it's a huge data leak, you're gonna have to report it to ICO. How is that going to work? And you're going to have to report it back to your insurance. So the technical and non-technical, they do work together. Mm -hmm. But the technical is all about looking at the incidents, looking at the attacks that are taking place, understanding the different dashboards, what do they mean, analyzing what you're getting from your cybersecurity attacks and information you've gotten on there, increasing your security controls. And a lot of money goes into defense in regards to defending your software, defending your um, remote network, your wireless network, and your laptop phones, but also 
there's a lot of money that goes into actually monitoring. And that monitoring is a huge aspect, that monitoring and analysis. And that's one side. Those are people who are working within organizations. Now you have your ethical hackers who are just paid to hack things. <laughs> that sounds very fun. It I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so they, there's like, we call them two different, well, three different types. So they're three different types of um, threat actors. So you have your... Um, you have your black hat, which are people or criminals. They're doing it for purely money. Um, they're not doing this because, you know, they, they just want money at the end of the day or they want something. Maybe they're trying to get information for a competitor or something. Then you have your gray hackers. So sometimes you see that somebody would report a vulnerability to a company and they get paid. Mm. That's a gray hack because they're not, the company's not asking them to do it. But because they've done it on their own accord and the company's like, okay, we recognize it and we thank you. Here's some money for your time. Or can you come in and like tell us a bit more about the vulnerability and we'll pay you for cons consulting. Then they become a gray hat. Then you have your white hat, which is people I'm describing where they just employ someone to come, whether it's a social engineer or ethical hacker. Ethical hacker is going to be more on the systems, whether it's through phishing attacks or just actually just hacking the system in general. And from their reports, you're highlighting these are the vulnerabilities that you need to patch up as a company. And then they give that report and then their incident response team or their security operations center will take that information to then improve their preventive security measures or preventive security controls. Now with um, the other side of like social engineering, it's I think it's more fun because it's more psychological. It could be from trying to get into the building to more like trying to extract information for someone. So mm. it looks at all the security, looks at the physical security, the administrative security um, and internal risks. So those, I would say like the two roles of people who work outside the organizations, but their role is to try and figure out how to basically hack the organization mm. and then let the organization know that these vulnerability exist and these are the things that you guys will need to do. And the fun thing about cybersecurity is you're, there's always going to be new attacks. You don't know who the threat actors are. You don't know the capabilities of the threat actors. So you have to kind of be constantly learning about the new attacks, whether it's through conferences, networking, research, OSNIT, open source. You constantly have to be updated because you don't know what type of creative way or loophole that somebody is going to find. And then outside of that, you have to kind of also do those capability and training within yourself. So when I used to work in government, we used to do a lot of um, intelligence training on thinking in the mind of an attacker. If somebody was going to attack or if someone's going to do something, how do we, what would that person do? And then we we then put our minds in the mind of the um, hacker or the threat actor. And then we start saying, okay, I'm going to do this X, Y, and Z. Then we walk back mm. based on what I think they're going to do. Going back, where are the loopholes and how do we as an organization then tackle those loopholes? So it's, it's, it's a really tough job. Um, I'm not going to lie. And I think the more technical side, which are the people doing um, the event monitoring because that's a 24 hours job oh, wow. so those tend to be more shift work so like 12 hours and then they might take a day then another 12 hours like site reliability engineers and kind of like devops side when you're on call yeah that's that looks intense so yeah. that i would say that that's the most intense side of it yeah. so it's 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 understanding um technical side i say it's it's fun you know there there's also like security software development which is yeah. more like the devs the ops yeah i was gonna say the wasps we love OWASP, don't we, we amber we love it <laughs> <laughs> so that's the open web application security project isn't it yeah um and that's all about kind of being able to develop securely and i think something that a lot of developers or i wasn't aware of it when i was learning to code just like the fundamentals in in um building a secure web application and how complicated that is and as well like you mentioned it like because the threat landscape is changing so quickly all the time you're constantly having to update yourself and kind of stay stay um yeah like one step ahead of of the attackers so do you have any advice or like resources or things that you think are important that you'd want to pass on to people who are not necessarily in cybersecurity but have the responsibility of building technology, which is used by people who are trusting them with our data, their data. So I would say like there are different school of thoughts. I mm -hmm. know there are some people that don't trust users and trust 
computers, so they mm. tend to lean more on software. Um, you you'll be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> there are some people who believe that the users are or people are the weakest link. Yes, yeah. and because of that, how they approach it is they are more reliant on softwares than people. Mm-hmm. And um, there are some other people which I think is the, more of the school that I lean onto, which is for security to work, everybody has to be involved. Security is everybody's job. It's mm-hmm. not just a security team job. Everybody has to be on board the security, which is why security culture and awareness is so important. And it's not just throwing and saying, you know, this is our policy, you have to follow it. But are you doing brainstorming sessions? Are you getting your team to actually um, say what you're thinking or share your thoughts on your security policy and your security framework? And by doing that, you let people buy into your security vision, but it also allows people to be security aware. Because unfortunately, a lot of internal risk still happens, which is why, you know, people will be surprised at why are we still getting weird emails it's because people still fall through them. Yeah. You know? yes. yeah. So and because of that, somebody may just not know. Not everybody is so security aware. You know, mm-hmm. your average mm-hmm. person doesn't really care about security. They just care about convenience and do, do their job and they go home. Mm-hmm. But I think by getting everybody within the company to be involved in security that's literally in my opinion the best way to improve your security now when it comes to you thinking about your threats actors and landscape you can't predict anything and if you're going to get in is to be commercially aware you know there are different magazines there's information security magazines there's cyber security ventures that you can look at um you know look at ico reports on like you know what are like the recent data leaks that are happening Keep your, yourself, you know, what are the different methods? What are the different tactics? You know, mm. the TTPS, what are those? You know, what techniques are you seeing? What tactics are you seeing? Um, and keeping your head on the ground and mm. having conversations with people. I think one of the great things about cybersecurity, even though it's, it's like a close knit community, but everybody's sharing because everybody understands the burden of working in the industry. Yeah. So every time there's a new attack, everybody's sharing. Somebody is doing a, a Twitter thread. Yeah, there's always a Twitter <laughs> thread. <laughs> So, you know, keep an eye on the ground, have conversations, network, um, and know that you're not alone. I mean, to me, I feel like the people I feel not sorry for, but the people who I admire because of the responsibility are CISOs. Mm. Yeah. Because the responsibility of security, you're trying your best, but you can't account for everybody. And if somebody makes one mistake, unfortunately, you get um, the blame for So it. what is a CISO and what are their responsibilities? So a CISO is a chief information security officer or you have your chief security officer, mm-hmm. either of those ones. And they are they have the executive responsibility for the security of the company, mm. um, which means that they have to basically understand the security architecture of the company and ensures that security is stable security takes place they have to work with all the different teams that i've talked about within security and make sure that it works but unfortunately like i said because security is for everybody but not everybody feels like security is for them and mm-hmm. unfortunately people feel like security is um it feels like a parent is how i describe it you yeah know? like a barrier to what yeah you're trying to do, right? but you can't do this you can't do that mm-hmm. But at the same time, security is needed because without security, everything's going to fall. So unfortunately, if somebody does make mistakes, sometimes it does, um, CISOs or CSOs do get the rap for that, unfortunately, mm-hmm. within the industry. So I would say that security is for everybody and everybody, even if you don't want to get into cybersecurity, having an information about security is going to be so important, especially with where we're going, Mm. with AI, with machine learning, (laughs) things more being on the internet with cloud. Mm. Uh, I haven't even gone to third party risk. (laughs) (laughs) Because that's that's like, that's another, that's another kettle of worms. So security is everybody's job is what I'll say. Yeah, I'd love to know your thoughts on whether the risk has um, increased since the pandemic. I was listening to a podcast, I think you recommended me to listen to it. um, And they were saying about how they'll call remote workers and say, we're getting you a new laptop because they like kind of know that people are sick of their old laptops. Mm-hmm. And we're getting you a new laptop get, um, to give me your name, address, the software that you're using. And they're able to get out so much information from them. So would you say that um, the risk has now increased because of remote working? Or do you think that now there's more awareness of um, social engineering and phishing scams that is kind of balanced out? I, th- I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. 
Um, not to be a pessimist, <laughs> but I think it's because understanding the con- economic levels that we're in, living standards are going mm. down. People are losing their jobs in tech, yeah, you know, which gives you know doors for people who may not consider going down the other route to go down the other route. Um, I feel like a lot of economic insecurity is going to increase, even people who may not even know much about like hacking to just try their Mm -hmm. luck to see what they can do so i do think that things are going to get worse but i do think the knowledge level is slowly getting better i think people are starting to recognize security and the value of it i think a lot more i think covid definitely helped with the security and with a lot of our infrastructures getting hacked i think a lot of companies understand the importance of security now but in regards to will it get better, I think there's definitely going to be more threat actors. Mm. But I think that slowly we're building the knowledge base to be a general thing and not just in the hands of a few. Yeah, because it feels like they're using more sophisticated like ways of phishing. So I feel like one of our colleagues put up on LinkedIn that she got a text message saying like, oh, like, mom, my phone has been like fell somewhere. This is my friend's number. You need to go on this website and do something. And so like your initial response is, oh, like my child is, I don't have time to think about if this is a phishing thing. Like I'm just going to go on the website or like send this person these details um, because they've sparked an emotion in in people. For sure. And I think that's what I love about cybersecurity is psychology. I mean, if you like like criminal dramas. (laughs) I don't. um, (laughs) then you would love you love cybersecurity. It's all about psychology. It's all about thinking how do people act, how do people behave, how to get somebody in a panic state yeah. that you're not thinking clearly. Yeah. And thinking about trusted sources. Um, okay, who do you trust? Okay, how do I make myself somebody that you trust? It's all about trust. Yeah. If yeah. you look at the whole thing with social engineering, it's all about trust. Um and I do think, like I said, as things are getting worse, you're gonna see more. We've seen with the HMRC. Wait, what happened with HMRC? Oh, with people pretending to be HMRC for a while. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like other other ones. Even recently I've seen Royal Mail. I've seen Yeah. So you know, you just see different different types of like versions and dip, dip like, you know, I just don't trust anyone. Um, just me because I'm in cybersecurity, you see a lot of things. But I almost got hacked on Christmas. Well, the day before Christmas. No, what happened? On my WhatsApp. Ooh. Literally. 2022. It, 2022 oh okay but you know what thank god that i practice what i preach yeah (laughs) if i didn't so what happened was um i got a call from someone um so one of my mentors she's nigerian i'm nigerian um and i know that she has this group called ladder back down where a lot of us professionals help other people who are interested in coming into the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that she does a lot of work in Nigeria. So this person calls me and I I, cl- I know they had a Nigerian accent, but they're like, oh, um, um, this person's um, PA, I'm just calling you because we're having a meeting today at 8 p.m. I just want to know if you're going to be at the meeting. I'm like, this is 24th of December. As much as I would love to support, please tell her that I won't be able to make the meeting. Mm. So that's fine. I'm just going to send you a link. Um, for the zoom link um, from the zoom link um, and if you can click that I'll just put your name on the list so that I know like for the next one you know you get an email Mm -hmm. so as he's talking to me something and mind you he called me at 6 40 a.m so I just woke up so I'm I'm already like half awake half asleep I'm talking to this person yeah so I was like but something was like Something about this is a little fishy. Why would he still need my distance if I said I can't make the meeting? Mind you, as we're talking, he said, no, he said, you're going to get a code. He said, can you please tell me what the code is? It's just so, and I, and I opened my eyes. I was like, wait a minute, something's not right. I looked at the code. I quickly cut off the phone. Did you know this guy locked me off from my phone number because he was trying to change it to a business number? Huh? But luckily, because I had a two-factor authentication. <laughs> yeah, so he was trying to get. He wasn't your, able to 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 go in. Yeah, because I had my pass. I had my email. I had my passcode, and then fingerprint. <laughs> yeah. So because of my passcode, he couldn't get in. 
Mm. Now imagine if I did not have two fact authentication. Okay, wait, <laughs> let me go on more. What's up? You have to do it on what's you have to get two factor authentication. authentication on your WhatsApp. Yeah. Oh, do you have that? Yeah. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, even with that, like it was was it last year that Uber had the attack where somebody just kind of brute force kept sending the two factor authentication requests and the person got fatigue from receiving it so many times and just gave it to them in the end. <gasps> like it's just like even with multi-factor authentication, you can you can have that kind of like effect. Yeah, yeah. I, even someone recently, um, I was in a group and she was saying that she keeps getting an email bombarded. Is is there a way to stop it because she keeps getting mm. loads of emails? And I said, best thing you need to do is speak to your administrate administrator security person and tell mm. them to change your email to something that's more complicated. And then you need to go to a website called A Vibe in Porn. Yes. To yes. See how far your email has been compromised yeah. so you can actually at least use that as a case study to say that your email needs to be changed mm -hmm. and then when she changed it it became a little bit better she no longer had those emails but it's it's crazy how creative and mind you in 2019 i think there was a vulnerability that was found on whatsapp that you could hack someone via audio yes yeah so this is too much <laughs> so you know the attacks and the creativity like i said is getting more and more. Yeah, it knows more <laughs> Especially with, like you were saying, with the developments in AI and machine learning, we now have vishing and people are able to generate audio and video of people that we do trust yep. and it, to a level of sophistication that it can convince you that that is the person you're speaking to. So um, yeah, no, scary threat landscape, definitely evolving, but that's all the more reason that we will need to be a little bit more interested in it, right? In mm -hmm. cybersecurity as a concept. So you've built a successful business getting marginalized women into cybersecurity and encouraging them to get into the career, but also to, to level up in that career. So why do you think it's more important? Why do you think it's important for women of color and marginalized people to be more involved in cybersecurity? I think it's because we're the most vulnerable online. Mm -hmm. um, and in my previous, in my last role um, within civil service, um, I was working in modern slavery, human trafficking, and online child sexual exploitation. Mm -hmm. um, and seeing some of the stuff you see on the dark web and having conversations, um, I was having conversations that I was like, okay, I don't need to be in this conversation. Somebody from this community needs to be in this conversation. I can't yeah. speak for the Filipino community. I can't yeah. speak for the Chinese mm -hmm. community. Yeah. And I can't even speak for Eastern European community. Mm -hmm. um, there are going to be other nuances that I'm going to miss and understanding how vulnerable we are online um, and not even from the element of, you know, simple hacking, but people being trafficked. Mm -hmm. um, it, it scares me. And it's all the reason why I wanted to make this a global organization, but organization for minority women, mm -hmm. because we are the most vulnerable. Um, and hoping that it's not just teaching us to get into the industry, but it's also teaching us skills and tips to be safe online. And hopefully that we can also share it to our children or our community mm -hmm. um, and pass it on because it's, you know, threat actors are always going to prey on those who are vulnerable and mm -hmm. those who they feel like society may not listen to in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. So because of that, they're going to go for marginalized women or people from marginalized groups. So if people are equipped with the knowledge and they can see certain things, then they can protect themselves and then they can advocate for themselves. Like I said, it's different communities that need to be in conversations, especially at a governmental level, um, which is what I'm hoping for one day. Mm -hmm. But that's why I wanted to create this. It was to create a space where more people can have conversations, more people can be aware, and also more people can make decisions because are we creating technology that are for everybody? Mm -hmm. or are we creating technology that are for the few? Mm -hmm. and i think it's it's not it's, it's latter so because of that we do need people to be in conversations especially as we're going through this technological frontier and my passion is not even for women in minority groups but also women over 35 you know as we're going through yeah. this technological boom ai is coming to take some jobs yeah. i don't want anyone to be left behind yeah um and you know rich communities are going to suffer the marginalized communities mm -hmm. so that's another element of of why i'm passionate about um bringing more women in and just bringing more pe people from minority groups into the industry is that there's a space for you there is a lack of talent as they always say mm -hmm. um and our aim is to show that actually there is talent and seeing how we can help whether it's through skills training 
partnership, work experience, anything that we can do, just help him make that bridge between those who are new to the industry, get into the industry, and also to help those who are in the industry thrive and hopefully break barriers to get into CSO positions or CSO positions. Fantastic. That is very inspiring. And you're definitely sowing the seeds for a very different future in terms of the landscape and diversity within cybersecurity. So it's really exciting. Thank you so much, Steph. That is the end of part one. And stay tuned for part two, where next week we will be speaking to Steph about her biggest career challenges and my favorite segment, what's the tech tea? (laughs) Tune in next week. Available on all major podcast platforms.